Len and Eddie have raised like the most important issue that faces us, I think, as independent media and at this conference. Are we here to interpret the world or to change it? And they clearly said we're here to change it. Um, much of what goes on in independent media, and I would have to say including the real news right now, is still too much interpreting the world. Um, there's, there's a stratum of us, and I include myself in it, who get off on analysis. We like it. It's interesting. You know, so, and, the, and the more realistic, the more complicated, the better the analysis, the more interesting it is. But what do we do with it? So we had to face this question of the real news. We, were, we started off in Toronto. Um, I used to produce a, a debate show on CBC. And we had a national audience for 10 years, around five nights a week, live across Canada. We were the show, current affairs show, debate show in the country. Uh, we had influence. I think what we did made it possible, created space to say that Canada would not enter the war in Iraq on the side of the United States. Uh, we were a factor. I don't think we did the whole thing, but we were a factor. Uh, but even then, that wasn't really going to change things. So we, we realized, first of all, if we really want to change things, we had to be in the United States, because that's kind of where the heart of the problem was. Uh, so we moved to Washington. And we started doing news from Capitol Hill and Washington for a couple of years. And then it really became clear that we have to answer the question, where is change going to come from? And it's very clear that trying to influence the elites to be more reasonable, to be more rational, <laughs> is a pointless effort. <laughs> Let me say, I'm happy there's still some people that try to do it. <laughs> And if they can even get a modicum of change in policy through doing it, it's a good thing. I'm for modicums of change, even though what I want to do is transformative change. Modicums of change are good too. Because I think the starting point has to be the well-being of the people. And even a modicum of a better well-being is better. But it doesn't change anything. And the problem with the ruling elite now is they can't even come up with modicums. They, they can't even rule in their own interests. Their own banking system is going to collapse again. They haven't done anything about the 0708 crash. Everything's the same. They know climate change and its consequences are coming. They're paralyzed. All they can really think about is how to make money out of it. And what is their answer? Same answer they've always had. War. Endless war. They, they, they can't e even solve, like, in, even in terms of their own basic interests. They are so paralyzed at the national political level. I mean, of course, they can get together to make sure that people are exploited as much as possible, as <laughs> intensely as possible. But they're basically incapable of even the smallest reforms. I interviewed Ralph Nader a year and a half, two years ago. I asked him, the kind of reforms he was able to achieve in the 1960s, are they still possible? And he said, no. He said, we had a very specific window. You can't even, you know, simple stuff. So. As independent news, we really have to decide that if we're in this to change the world, not just to interpret it, not just to come up with stuff people can consume, meaning analysis wonks like me, we can't keep just speaking to this small spectrum of the population. And we are a very small spectrum of the population. Even if there's four or 5,000 people at this conference, you know, if you look at the society of who's watching all the various forms of independent media, it's a modicum, a tiny section of society. And, and, and I'm not saying it isn't important that we address this section of the society. It's very important. But it's not where real change is going to come from. Real change is going to come from people who work one or two jobs, come home exhausted, have to figure out how to feed their kids, pay the rent, and often, often, if we're talking Gilmore Homes, run out of food before the month is over. I mean, actually talking about hungry kids, but I mean, Eddie's down there organizing uh, food gives away at Gilmore Homes. Um, we did a story about the strike at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Uh, a guy is making $13.50 an hour. He's 
cleaning surgical rooms after surgery. Uh, he has to take special drugs in case he gets HIV, to prevent <coughs> HIV infection. He's been working there 14 years. Now, when all the rest of the mass media during the Baltimore resistance, like people call it the Baltimore uprising, it sounds good, but it was resistance. We're not yet at uprising level. Uh, but it was a big thing for Baltimore, because Baltimore has been kind of asleep for a while. Uh, th there was some lip service to the issue of poverty on mainstream media. You could occasionally, when they, when they got tired of just talking about thugs and criminals, Occasionally they would say, oh yeah, there's underlying social conditions, there's poverty here. <laughs> and that was a big statement to even acknowledge that there's poverty. But what they don't want to acknowledge, which we said on The Real News, and we did in some depth, is people are making money out of this poverty. <laughs> right? There's the incarceration industry. There's all the spin-off of the drug industry. There's, a, you know, the cops are making money. The people building prisons are making money. But the most important thing, really, is why can you get someone to work for 13, 15 an hour at Johns Hopkins? Because people are desperate for jobs. I mean, unemployment is there because it's, it, it creates this pool of cheap labor. Everybody here knows this story. We were able to say that right in the midst, in the moment of that crisis, and, and, and connect how these systemic issues are only going to be solved through people taking things into their own hands. And that's what we were doing in the midst of this crisis. So, I mean, one of the questions I used to get most in the last three years is, why'd you go to Baltimore? Why'd you go to Baltimore? So thankfully, no one's asking that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but the question Glenn raised, it's the critical question facing us. And it's why we went to Baltimore. We're in a transition stage now. Our current, majority of our current audience, and still a lot of our content, although we're starting to transition out of this, is still for people that like analysis. Now, I'm not saying we don't need to do analysis, but we need to do analysis in the way that ordinary people can engage with it. And that's our challenge. And, and we don't, we, we are in Baltimore so we can build a mass audience. Now, why Baltimore? Well, there's a bit, some specific issues in Baltimore, or, or circumstances, and exist in some other cities across North America, too. But, Baltimore City is about 615,000 people. 63% um, of that is African American. The county, Baltimore County, is 820,000 people and it's 65% white. The median income in Baltimore is $40,000. Median income in the county, $66,000. Official poverty rate, Baltimore City, 23%. Official poverty rate in the county, less than 6%. So if you're local television news and you have an advertising model, who are you doing news for? Well, obviously, wealthy white people in the county. So you go look at who's on television. 75% of the on-air talent is white in a city that's 63% black. Because it's an advertising-driven model. And so that's who we're appealing to. So there's, a, there's an opportunity here. A, see, I think the weak link in the, in the mass media chain, and in fact it's the weak link I think in the whole political chain, is at the level of certain cities. Uh, I think nationally to try to mount uh, either independent media of significance uh, or independent politics of significance, at this time it's almost a waste of effort. I'm not saying people, people that are into it, good, I'm glad they are. But I don't think that's the nodule of change. There's certain cities where there could be breakthroughs, and Baltimore, I think, is one of those cities. There's another piece to this. One of these, the reason is this weakness of local television news is that it just ignores the concerns at even simpler, simple levels of the majority of the population of the city. There's another very important part to this. If, you, if we really want to address a mass audience, you've got to go local something we really started to understand when we were in D.C. and then we started coming to Baltimore. Most people, their political, their horizon is their direct experience. And that's the difference between a mass audience and an audience that's more made up of intellectuals, have more education. We, we access information a lot through culture. We have a lot of building blocks of information. You know, 
talk about even something in Syria. Most people in this room will have a basic knowledge of Syria. I talk to young black activists in Baltimore, activists, not, you know, less politicized people. They not only didn't know who Mubarak was, they had no idea there'd been an Egyptian uprising, they had no idea Mubarak had fallen, they had no idea there had been a mass movement in Wisconsin. Like if it didn't happen in Baltimore, it didn't happen. <coughs> and that's a reflection, I think, of where the majority of the mass audience is. It's about their direct experience, and the direct experience is the city. So I think a few things. Number one, independent media needs to pick a few places that are real possible points of change. I think Baltimore is one. I think Detroit could be one. Oakland could be one. There's other cities like that. <coughs> They're either going to be majority or big African American or Latino populations. And then we have to figure out, and we're starting to figure out, how to speak to that. We have to learn, because right now we know how to talk to people in this room. Uh, like what Eddie said at Gilmore Homes, that town hall, what people wanted to know is why are my children growing up with rats? The place is infested with rats. Because they only pick up garbage once a week. So we're going to do a story about why is the city only picking up garbage once a week? And we're going to follow that story. Or the food desert issue. Or, I mean, Eddie's been working on trying to get, you wouldn't believe what he's been going through. He's been trying to get some basketball hoops up in a destroyed old, what used to be a basketball court. And the city's been fighting him every step of the way <coughs> Supposedly liability issues is ridiculous because there used to be a basketball court here, so why all of a sudden now? But the basic point really isn't the basketball court, but it's kind of symbolic. The real point is there's no rec centers. This is right now we're Baltimore and particularly this area around Gilmore Homes, murder is up 40% over last year. You know, Baltimore, we're talking this year, we're probably going to hit 270, 280 murders. You know, per capita, this will push Baltimore maybe in the top four or five murder capitals of, of America. Uh, and it's almost considered acceptable, like normal for Baltimore. And, and one of the things in the town hall, one of the guys says, he says, you, you know, our kids grow up treated like animals. Is it a surprise to you that when they grow up, they act like animals? And it's actually like, what else are you going to do in this kind of desperation? So our our challenge as an independent news is to, is to learn how to do news that will engage with ordinary people, and not just people in the most desperate circumstances. The truth is, I think real change is, is going to come more from working families, not so much well, Gilmore Homes, yes, but some of the areas that, are, that people work at Hopkins and, and the various, uh, at the port and other places. How do we engage with them? <coughs> So they start to get the necessity. <coughs> we have this slogan. We don't use it publicly because it doesn't sound very journalistic. But our slogan is, don't roll over, take over. <laughs> so how do we do news for people who want to take over? That's our challenge. So we're going to de develop some shows. Like we're going to do, one of the things we're doing, we're going to spend a lot of time on arts and culture. We're going to really tap into the hip hop community in Baltimore. Um, we're going to start doing a regular news show. We are, we are going to get on TV in Baltimore. It's, uh, the internet, is, is, it's not yet for a mass audience. You can't really watch on, on the internet. Ordinary people get home, they turn on the TV. If you're not there, they're not going to connect. So we are, we're, we're actually buying our way onto Comcast for an hour every night. Um, anyway, I think the thing we can talk about more in this session is, 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 is that we have you know, we, we, gotta, we can't just understand, we can't just interpret. We've got to go where the nodules of change are, which means we have to speak to and help develop this movement for taking over. So what is taking over? You know, it must be 10 minutes. Oh, go ahead. All right. In the United States, it's going to be elections. I mean, it's my opinion, but I think it's silly to think. Listen, where does power come from? Mao may have been wrong about some things, but he wasn't wrong about where power comes from. It's guns. I mean, why did the Panthers have such a dramatic effect? It's just the picture of them standing there with shotguns. 
I'm not saying that's the way to get, you know, in the final analysis, you're not going to get power just because you stand there with shotguns. But it was such a symbol, because that is where power comes from. So who has the guns? Well, the police, if you're talking locally. In Baltimore, it didn't take long to mean the National Guard. <clears throat> Which means you have to actually take, you have to control government. You need to get hold of those guns. You have to use the, the whole framework of laws and legislations, which, which is now there. I mean, the, the framework of legislation is there to enforce the disparity in wealth. It's there to protect people that own stuff. And the more stuff you own, the more they protect you. And that's what, it, you know, there's in some ways too much focus on the cops. It would be like blaming the soldiers, American soldiers in Iraq for the Iraq war. Yes, they have. If you're in Iraq, you're going to shoot, you're going to fight whoever's there occupying your country. And the same thing happens in Baltimore. The police, to a large extent, feel like an occupying army. <coughs> but who's sending them? There? So, in the final analysis, we and we have to figure out how to do this journalistically because we're not propagandists. We're not the mass movement needs its own media. I don't consider us the ma that. What I mean is, it's, the mass movement actually does need media that's purely agitational, purely does, is more politicized, if you want. We need to do it within the framework of still being journalists, because I think that's what the mass movement needs from us, a reliable source of news that will even say the mass movement's wrong, or whatever it is. You know, we'll go over the facts of it. But in the final analysis, there needs to be an electoral, a movement with candidates. Just candidates getting elected can do very well. Maybe a little bit, and if they do a little bit, good for them. But if we want real change, you have, the day has to come when a city council, a progressive united front of a city council, does something dramatic, like turns, starts renovating all the boarded up houses in Baltimore and renting to low income families, which will infuriate the banks and the real estate speculators. And when that legislation gets passed and the banks and the whole uh, real estate elite of Baltimore try to trash it, that day has to come when there's 50,000 people, 100,000 people come out to support that legislation. They close down the port of Baltimore because the workers go on strike in support of the legislation. Those candidates with that kind of mass movement, that's transformative, and within the, the scope of that, we're trying to find our role. So that's what we're doing. Thank you very much.